we still continue to do trunk shows. We had revenue goals for the month, and so if we weren't meeting our revenue goals, then we would, you know, set up a trunk show stat. Right. But online, I, it was just a totally different story. We could not sell our dresses. I have to assume your cash reserves were getting close to running out. Not only did we run out, it actually went into the negatives. Our bank account, I think at one point, said like negative 2,000 or something, and I didn't know you could draw down beyond zero. So that was a wake-up call. From NPR, it's How I Built This, a show about innovators, entrepreneurs, idealists, and the stories behind the movements they built. I'm Guy Raz, and on the show today, how a relentless morning routine inspired Sarah LaFleur to build a simpler wardrobe for women, a multi-million dollar brand called M.M. LaFleur. Back in 2004, an American psychologist named Barry Schwartz published a book called The Paradox of Choice. Barry's argument, and we've talked about it before on the show, is pretty straightforward. He concluded that having lots and lots of choices has actually made us more anxious and less happy. I mean, think about it. Do you ever get anxious at Chipotle or In-N-Out Burger? I'm guessing you don't because they have very few choices. Burger, cheeseburger, double cheeseburger, taco, burrito, bowl, quesadilla. You get my point, right? Having fewer choices actually decreases anxiety. Now, imagine waking up every morning and agonizing over what to wear. You go to your closet and you either hate everything in it or you can't decide what would look good. And I suspect this is not a thought experiment for many of you. In fact, this was how Sarah LaFleur started her day every morning as she went off to her corporate job at a firm in New York. And Sarah wasn't alone. The research is pretty clear. On average, women spend a lot more time getting ready in the morning than men. So Sarah decided to try and tackle this problem by tackling the closet, essentially by coming up with a line of clothing that was simple and elegant without too many options that would speed up the morning routine, clothes that were well-made, looked great and professional at a more reasonable price. But like so many of the founders I've talked to, Sarah had this ambitious plan and not the slightest idea initially of how she was going to carry it out. For starters, she knew nothing about the fashion industry. She had no idea how to make a dress or a pair of slacks. She just knew what she liked. But since she launched M.M. Lafleur, it's grown into a business closing in on $100 million in annual sales. And a lot of the company's designs are inspired by Sarah's childhood in Asia. Her dad was an American diplomat, and for most of Sarah's childhood, the family lived in Japan, where her mother was from. And Sarah grew up speaking both English and Japanese. It was tough. The, the term that people use in Japan to describe biracial kids is half. I guess we say that too, half Japanese, half American. But my parents always said, you're not half, you're double. You're both Japanese and you're, you're also <laughs> American. <laughs> and so I think they were really insistent on that fact. But I think on a day-to-day basis, like I remember when I was in Tokyo, I really didn't want to use my last name, Lafleur. You know, uh, in Japan, your last name really signifies whether you are Japanese or not, so much so that you, Korean Japanese people or Chinese Japanese people, they will change their last name to signify that they are truly Japanese. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of hid my American last name. And then I would say simultaneously, when I, I came to the U.S., I had the opposite experience, um, especially around college. Um, I went to a school that was incredibly preppy and that prep culture I, I'd never seen before in Japan. Mm. Tell me about, about your mom. Did she um, did she work? Yeah, she did. And I mean, really a huge inspiration. I mean, I would say the reason I started my business in many ways goes back to my mom. She is Japanese, raised in Japan and, you know, very, very unusual person for someone of her generation. She worked throughout her life, um, continues to work today. She loves her job. Um, She runs a business selling travel jewelry out of Tokyo, which she started because I think in many ways it's it's tough being a diplomat's wife. You have to move every three to four Mm -hmm. years. And I think the common assumption is that the wife usually gives up her career so that she can, you know, be the diplomat's wife, host receptions, et cetera. But she couldn't. She always t- says, "I can't wait for Monday," <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, your kids are like, "What? Excuse me? Like, how about us on the weekends?" But um, she just she loved going to work, and I think that was a real inspiration for me and my sister. 
You know, we never assumed that we would not get jobs. That was the only thing we assumed. So, I mean, looking at your mom as as this kind of inspiration for how to be an entrepreneur, did you, I mean, I, I can't imagine as a kid you thought, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, or, or did you? I mean, Oh, God, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I mean, she didn't hide how hard it was um, trying to start the business with her friends, having her friends leave the business all of a sudden, out of nowhere, financial struggles, just hard personal conversations that she was having with her business partners. And I remember as a kid, I would come down in the middle of the night to grab a glass of water and I would see my mom sitting in the armchair with a a light above her head sipping whiskey um, on the rocks and I just remember thinking wow it is hard Hmm. so when it came time for you to go to college um, you went to Harvard so I mean you must have been you know a pretty good student Yes and no. I think I I never fancied myself to be this super smart person. I knew I was a really hard worker, and my mom always used to say, you know, um, this is in Japanese, which means, like, you're the kid who tries hard. And so um, my mom meant that in an encouraging way, but I never in my mind thought, like, well, you know, I'm going to be the smartest person in the room. I've actually, I've probably never thought that in my life. Um, I just knew that whatever... I wanted to do, it would have to be through sheer willpower, sheer determination. Yeah. I mean, when you when you graduated, what did you think you, you were going to do with your life? Did you think, okay, I'll get a job and go work somewhere and figure it out? Um, I should take a step back and say, like, basically from the time I was in high school, I wanted to become a, a refugee camp officer. I wanted hmm. to be a logistics officer. And I started researching refugee issues, got really, really passionate about it. And then I thought, gosh, that's what I want to go do. And so the summer between my junior and senior year, I had this opportunity to go volunteer at a refugee camp in Zambia. Wait, you did this You did this while you were still a student? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. You know, I think if I can point to one life-changing experience that I've had, that would definitely, hmm. that would be the one. I mean, this refugee camp was, I think, like 10 hours from Lusaka, which is the capital of Zambia. So we would drive to this small town that was two hours away, and I would buy random pieces of furniture there. And then we would, you know, paint this building that we fixed. Um, I mean, it was it was basic stuff. It was it was basic stuff. But I think I, I also, I think simultaneously, I realized the, the powerlessness of it, of, of myself um, really being in that space. I would have... People come up to me just as I was, you know, walking back to the dorm where we were staying. And he would say, I, would, I have AIDS. My, my wife has died. Um, I have one kid who's dying. Is there any way you could help me? I mean, yeah. this, you know, and this would just happen on a mm-hmm. daily, if not hourly basis. And uh, it just fundamentally changes the way you see life. Mm-hmm. And I went with this nonprofit organization. And um, one day the leader asked me, okay, so we are, we're short on money, and so we're going to have to make a trade-off. We can either continue to buy lunch or we can continue to spend on fuel. <laughs> and I was looking at him being like, wait, we have to choose between lunch and fuel? What kind of a choice is that? Like, how are we supposed to work like that? And then I came back on campus senior year. Um, I had all of these friends who were coming back from their investment banking internships with mm-hmm. signing bonuses and I just like couldn't believe the like I I, you know that was more than the money I had raised all summer Mm. and it sparked some sort of curiosity I think for me and then a a mentor that I had who I'd been with at the camp at the time she was someone who had worked in investment banking and she said to me you know Sarah it's it's never a bad idea to go learn how to work with the big boys Mm -hmm. kind of hate that expression big boys yeah yeah but uh but I knew what she meant, and um, and the money. I just couldn't believe yeah. that you could sign a piece of paper and you could have five thousand dollars in your checking account. Yeah, and I guess you just sort of got drawn into that because after college you went into into consulting, right? You went to work at at, at Bain. Yeah. And and wh- what did you do there? Um, I was what was called an associate consultant, um, and you are working on a case, which if you are at a company like. Bain. It's usually for a Fortune 500 company. And you are trying to solve a problem that the company presents to you, which might range from, you know, anything from we're trying to enter a new market. How should we do that to we have to cut costs? How should we do that? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, you know, a significant percentage of people who've been on the show, I'd say more than 10 percent 
worked in consulting for a couple of years early in their yeah. careers where you, mm. you're you basically paid to learn everything about a business in order to give them advice for how to be more efficient or to um, to run a better operation. And yes. And then oftentimes these, you know, people who were in consulting are sitting around saying, wait a minute, I think I could do that better. And then they <laughs> go on and they start a business. But it is actually really useful. I mean, it's super helpful in kind of training you and, and, and giving you expertise in an industry that you otherwise would have known nothing about. It's so true. You know, I, I mean, I didn't know how to do really basic things. Like, I didn't know how to write a business email. Uh, I didn't know how to do PowerPoint. That, that, like, that's a life skill. But they whipped me into shape. So hmm. it really, I think, set a certain standard for me that I knew I had to meet if I wanted to be taken seriously. So you, I, I guess you stayed at Bain for about three years, which is, yeah. I, I think, the sort of the average length of time, un- unless, you know, for people who decide that they want to make a career out of it. Yeah, that's right. Um, and you got this opportunity to go to work in South Africa. Um, yeah. You must have been 25 or 26. What did you What did you do there? I worked for a nonprofit called TechnoServe. So that was uh, started by a bunch of former McKinsey partners. And the idea was that uh, South Africa had a really, really interesting cha- challenge um, having gone through apartheid. You have this dual economy. You have the white economy and essentially the black economy. And the two operate incredibly differently. Hmm. And the question was, how can we get the the black South African farmers to plug into this incredibly successful supermarket economy? That was that was what I was working on. Um, and so I ended up spending over a year with them, I guess. And I mean, did you what was the idea to just to, to be there for about a year and then do something else? No, actually, this was this was the moment where I, you know, I kind of I think that was the moment where I discovered nonprofit wasn't for me. It wasn't the mission of the work. The mission of the work is so important, and I, I find it to be worth getting out of bed for in the morning. But I, my personality was wholly unsuited for it. Yeah. I think what, what irked me was the, the amount of delicacy and diplomacy that's really needed to push projects through in the nonprofit sector. It's a really admirable skill, and you need to have it to be successful in that world. And I, it was not something that I naturally had. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because you are the child of a diplomat and <laughs> like ha- had aspirations to work in in refugee camps. But the combination of of where you were in life and your sort of wanting to move quickly just wasn't the right fit at that at the time for that job. Yeah, you 2011, you come back to the United States and you go to New York and get a job at a private equity firm. Yes, yeah. So you can see how I ping pong in my career. Um, you know, that was actually what a lot of my colleagues at Bain ended up doing. They were either going to business school or they're going to private equity. And I had gotten rejected from business school. I was on the wait list. I was just I didn't really have a clear reason for why I wanted to go to business school. Hmm. Um, maybe they saw through that, or maybe you know I just wasn't a good enough candidate. But either way. Uh, I was on I was on the wait list, and then they released I think the the final candidates in August, and they said, "No, thank you." And, um, and just just to pause for a second, I mean, today obviously yeah. this is a for a variety of reasons a badge of honor, but back then, were you embarrassed by that? <laughs> oh my gosh, totally. Um, I mean, I I don't even know if it's a badge of honor now. A lot of people are like, "Oh, you you got a Harvard MBA, right?" And I'm like, "No, no, just I just went to college." <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I. I didn't get in. I don't. Yes, and and now I think I'm more comfortable talking about it. But I yeah. wasn't for a really long time. Um, all right. So you so you go uh, you get a job with a private equity firm. It's called Starwood Capital, and this is going to be like the beginning of your, you know, the next phase of your career. I mean, you're still in your 20s at this point, um, and private equity is intense, and you're looking for companies to invest in, and it must have been exciting. I mean, you get to New York, and what was it like? Um, well, I will start by saying it was, um, it was, this might be weird uh, after saying that my dream was to work in nonprofit to say this was my other dream job, but it really was. <laughs> I thought what they were doing was fascinating. And when I got the job, I took it and I started, gosh, January of 2013. And I thought this was going to be my dream job. So this is January of 2013. Oh, January 20, I'm sorry, January 2011. So, all right. So January 2011, you get to New York and... Um, you were just there for four months, um, which seems yeah. seems like something happened. It just seems unusual. What what hap- 
why? Why were you there for such a short time? Why'd you leave? You know, I um, I loved the job, but the short of it was that it was a, a terrible cultural fit for me. I was uh, one of two female investment professionals, I think, out of hmm. dozens, if not hundreds. The company culture was hyper-masculine, aggressive, swaggering, which all looks very cool on TV. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there was a part of me that idolized it too. But the truth is, it was terrible for me. I was, I think I professionally performed just fine, but internally, I mean, I, I started hyperventilating at work. Uh, I developed a weird tick. It was just very clear, I think, from week one, I was like, oh, I made a mistake. What was the breaking point? Because four months is, you know, it's a short time, and there must have been something that happened that you, you just said, I can't come back here anymore. <laughs> the breaking point was me just like crying uncontrollably and calling my friend being like, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. Hmm. I just, I generally felt like a loser. I mean, here I was, I, I spent three years at Bain and I, I moved to South Africa thinking well, that's going to, that's going to be my thing. And then, you know, after a year I decide, okay, it's not for me. So let me, let me give this thing a try. And I'm, th- I'm there for four months. Like the narrative I had written for myself was that I was a loser. And so it was... It was really, it was just a devastating time for me. When you told them you were leaving, were, were they shocked? I think my boss was surprised. I think private equity is filled with a bunch of people who are incredibly determined and want to climb the ladder. And here I was saying, like, I've been here four months and I'm out. Hmm. <laughs> and I remember the first thing he said to me was, don't you want to become vice president here? And I was like, that's honestly the last thing I want to do. And so you, you start to have real moments of doubt about who you are as a person. And um, yeah. up until that point, you're always like, Sarah, who goes to college? You know, Sarah, who works at Bay? And Sarah, who blah. Mm. Um, so much of my personal identity was tied up in the job that I had. And to, so to go from Sarah, who works in private equity, who flies on private jets to Paris, to Sarah, who doesn't have a job and is worried about how she's going to pay her COBRA payment next month, um, that was a, <laughs> that was a, a sucker. So at this point, you're like 27, 28 maybe. Yeah, 27, and I think. you would rather leave without a plan than to stay. Yes, and I would say would is a, that's a, a strong word. Like I felt like I had no choice but to leave without mm. a plan. I just needed to get out. Yeah. So um, I still remember that feeling when I like took the Metro North uh, on my last day back into the city. You can see out in front, the railway in front of you, and... I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, freedom. I'm, mm. I'm free again. And um, so yeah, I, I left without a plan. I like cried for a month. Mm. I'd started seeing my psychiatrist about a few months into, a couple months into that job because I was, you know, I was a nervous wreck. Yeah. And so I, you know, I was spending a lot of time actually in her office. I think I was probably going like two, maybe sometimes even three times a week just to feel normal again. Yeah. And um, that was around the time I had always had this idea for starting a clothing company for working women. Wait, you you always had this idea, or yeah? Well, I, I should say always, as in like when I when I was working management consulting because I could never find good clothes. And so, actually, I remember at my HBS interview, they they ask you, "What do you want to do with your life?" And so I said, "I want to go work in refugee camps." And they were like, "Okay, well, if there's if you had to go do something else, what would it be?" And I said, mm-hmm. "Well, you know, I really think someone should go start a workwear company for women because clothing out there is just terrible." And um, I remember the interviewer laughed, and she was like, "Tell me more about that." Um, mm. I think I think a lot of women can relate to that. So, so I had always had that idea, I guess, since working at Bain and since needing those clothes myself. But this just this idea. Yeah, idea. Like we all have idea. ideas, right? Like the, exactly, you know, right? exactly. Like somebody needs to make a better pickle, or uh, I, I shouldn't say that, great pickles, but whatever it is, right? <laughs> we all have these <laughs> things, and this was your thing. It was like, but it wasn't really a serious. Like you weren't sitting down at night and weekends writing a business plan for a clothing company. No, I mean, I was just like, what? Fashion? Like, I'm not even interested in fashion. Um, I just, I was like, I, but however, I am a consumer of clothes. Yeah. I have to wear clothes every day. Um, I, I care about looking good and gaining the respect of my peers and my clients. So I'm going to put effort into it. But God, it is so hard. Yeah. But so this is like the spring of 2011. You quit your job. And now you've mm-hmm. got time, which uh, uh, and sort of like one, if we're like watching one movie on this, you've got time and then you get, you know, you're excited and you think, now I can start this business. But there's another movie, which is you're going to see therapists 
I have to assume that you were experiencing some depression from, Mm -hmm. you know, leaving that job. That can be a hard time to get motivated to feel like, right? Did you just take some time to just kind of be sad and depressed? Or or were you thinking, I'm going to jump into this next idea? I remember being terribly sad and depressed and unwell. And I also remember thinking, I need to get moving or else I'm going to get stuck. Hmm. And so I only remember this because I remember the dates that I signed certain contracts. I signed uh, for a WeWork office starting May 1, back when WeWork was still very small. I think they had like two buildings in New York. And then I officially registered as a LLC June 1 um, in Delaware. So I just, I have records of those contracts, which makes me think like, okay, there was a part of me that that kept Kept pushing pushing myself. Yes. But then I also remember going on a run and um, stopping in the middle of the run because I had to like cry for 30 minutes. Um, and I think that was mid-July, right? So it was it was kind of a, it was a parallel process. It wasn't like, okay, now I'm done being sad and I'm going to go start my company. It was, it was, I was working through both things at the same time. So as you started to, as the kind of the, the gears in your head started to turn more and more about this idea of, of professional clothing for women, did you have a sort of a, a solid vision of what that would be or was it still kind of abstract in, in the spring of 2011? You know, surprisingly, my my vision for the product was very clear. Um, my mom, before she started her, her jewelry business, had worked in high-end fashion, and so I think through her, I got to see and touch a lot of these beautiful pieces of high-end clothing that she would bring home, not because she bought them, but, you know, as samples or as, as gifts. And I think she dressed also in that way, incredibly tailored and polished. And I think my big question when I was starting this business was, Why aren't there clothes like this for regular working women? You know, the clothes that I was shopping for at the time, it was always ill-fitting. It would rip a lot easily. Um, I would always have to get it tailored. Uh, It it just, it would wrinkle easily. I mean, there were so many things that were wrong with it, and I was spending so much money trying to dress professionally for work. So I I knew exactly the kind of clothing that I wanted to create, which is really like I wanted to sell dresses that would sell for $2,000 for a fraction of the price. And I I wanted to work with a luxury designer because I wanted my customers, I wanted regular working women to wear luxury quality clothing. So you you register an LLC. And I mean, what, like, if, if I said to somebody, all right, let's go start a clothing company, like, I would have no idea what to do. Okay, I register the LLC. And then and then what? First of all, you need money, right? So <laughs> how much money did you have at the time to start um, this thing? Very little. Uh, I had about $35,000 saved up, which is not very little. But, you know, in the context of starting a business, it does not get you very far. Right. But you had and saved this money over the course of your time at Bain and this I mean, private equity firm. My and, entire life, yeah, yeah. It was like the piggy bank that I had kept. Yeah. And what, like, what's thirty five thousand dollars going to gonna do? I mean, it's gonna last. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't go very far, which was the short story. Um, my parents also lent me thirty five thousand, so they said. Okay, okay, so you got seventy thousand. Yeah. So I started with seventy thousand dollars. And by the way, the idea was to see how far you could go, and then eventually fundraise. Or did you think I'm gonna go for um, fundraising right away? Yeah, it was. It was. I mean, I didn't. I couldn't even think about fundraising. Right. Like I knew through the grapevine, um, you know, the Bonobos founders, Warby Parker founders, both worked at Bain, um, and so I think, I mean, in some ways, they served as great role models. You, you, you kind of saw from afar that maybe it was possible to fundraise, and so I think in those initial days, it really it wasn't like this is the business plan. Let's go raise some money. Let's go start this business. It was like, does anyone know anything about making clothes? Because if you do, I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, when you know, we've had conversations with founders who, at this point, the first thing they do is start to reach out to anybody who will talk to them. They, you know, um, they'll send like cold emails and and cold call people for advice and. Is that is that who you who you are? Like, is that your personality? Is that what you did? I would say it was more organic. Um, again, I didn't know anybody who worked in fashion, uh, so 
I remembered that there was a, a woman um, who was a couple years ahead of me um, at college. She had gone to RISD to study interior design and I think textiles uh, mm-hmm. in interior design. And I was like, well, that's that's one step closer to fashion. Uh, so I reached out to her and I was like, hey, do you know anybody who works in fashion? And she was like, actually, I do know one person from RISD who went into fashion. So let me put you in touch with her. So she was the one fashion designer that I knew. And she put me in touch with her five headhunters in fashion, most of whom had no time for me. Uh, You know, they were like, what, Bain? Like, never heard of it. Don't care. Like, please come back when you're serious. I've got Calvin Klein on the other line. Yeah. But one of those five headhunters decided to take a chance on me. He, you know, said, let me see if I can help you out. Help you out with what? uh, Recruiting. Recruiting. (sighs) So, oh, so this headhunter so he said, let me see if I can help you find somebody to join find you. Find somebody as a co-founder. Because you could not, you felt like you couldn't do this by yourself. You didn't have the understanding or the knowledge of the industry. Yeah, that's right. And I think it's not only that I couldn't do it, I didn't want to do it. You know, I wanted to design the most beautiful dresses in the world. And I have not trained as a designer. Yeah. And so... It was really important to me that I had a high-end passionate designer. I, I had other designers who said, you know, why don't you just, you can do it yourself. Like, you can just copy yeah. these designs, you know, add a sleeve, you know, add whatever and, and sell it. And I was like, no, no, that is that is not what I want to do. I don't, I don't want to create more of what is already out there. I want to fundamentally actually create something different. Hmm. So there's this guy, he's a headhunter, and he agrees to kind of help you out. And he identifies somebody who's a fashion designer, you know, who you should meet. Um, Her name is Miyako Nakamura. Mm -hmm. Who was she? What what was she doing at the time? Miyako, at the time, I think had just left Zach Posen. She was their head designer. She was known in the fashion industry. And, um, you know, we were just in totally different worlds. I think that was actually my other kind of surprising moment. You know, I thought I understood what New York was about, but um, it was one of those moments where I was like, wow, I literally don't know anybody in the fashion world. And yet, like, the capital of fashion is New York City. The garment district is in New York City. And and our circles did not overlap at all. So uh, so you meet Miyako, and what's your pitch to her? Like, you you say, hey, I'm I'm starting this company. I want to make really beautiful, um, you know, clothing for professional women that is, you know, relatively affordable. Is, was that how you described it to her? Yeah, basically. She was like, what? You know, she the way she described it to me is she says, I thought everything in the world that needed to be designed had already been designed. Hmm. And I think she herself at that time was going through a, a kind of career crisis where she didn't really understand the point of design anymore because she thought it's all it's all already been done. Like, hmm. why, why bother? So this is what I'm, I'm curious about. You meet Miyako. She had been the lead fashion designer for Zach Posen, a major fashion brand, uh, you know, designer brand. You've got $70,000 in seed money <laughs> between you and the, and the loan. You, took. <laughs> you have zero experience. Obviously, you're intelligent, but no experience in fashion. You've got this kind of harebrained idea to start a company. And that's pretty much in a WeWork hot desk. Like, why mm-hmm. Why would she say, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll go work with you. I'm, I'm just, yeah, why, why would she agree to do this? Well, I'm, I'm just irresistible in person. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm totally joking. I, every investor that I've ever spoken to, I mean, frankly, like I've, anybody I have ever spoken to about this in any sort of detail, their follow-up question is usually like, what was she thinking? And why would she come and work for you? Totally fair question. Um, you know, I I don't want to answer for her, but I, I think for her, it was it just it was so different. It was so unlike anything else that had ever been proposed to her. This idea of designing for a group of women that she didn't even really know about working women, this idea that she always says, I never actually seen my clothes on a, a real person. That means a, a non-model. <laughs> um, I've never actually seen my clothes on the street. You know, she designed Oscar gowns. I think she designed a gown once for Natalie Portman. You know, that was kind of the, the world she was moving in. But she said there there was no practical element to the beautiful designs that I was making. And I think that was that was a big question mark for her. I mean, I that I understand, the creative side of it, right? But you couldn't even offer her, like, a steady income. You know, yeah, you, you know. could offer her partnership. But, like, she was going to be – she was not going to have an income for who knows how long. Yeah, I mean I- – I think, I mean, all of your questions are fair. I'm sure this could have played out very differently. I think the only way to describe it is that we had some sort of connection. Um, Hmm. 
you know, I was actually going to go with a different designer. I had met someone else who had been the head designer for of another very famous brand. And I actually wasn't even going to meet Miyako. I had told the headhunter, you know, I really like this other person. Like, she huh. feels like the right person. Like, you know, I don't really even care to meet with another candidate. And he was like, no, no, just meet with her because I think you guys are going to really hit it off. And even when we first met and I, you know, I was telling her about the, the kind of women I wanted her to design for, I said, you know, don't you know those women? They they walk to work in their flats and um, they have their heels in their bag. And once they get into the elevator, they change out into their heels. And she was like, no, I've never met anyone like that. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what world do you operate in? She was like, everyone I know walks to work in heels and stays in their heels all day. But huh. at that point, like, I didn't even know what was involved in designing clothing. Um, I share the story just to level set just how elementary my understanding of clothing manufacturing was. I remember yeah. um, Miyako early on said to me, we're going to need to find a pattern maker. And I was like, oh, no, no, don't worry. We're not going to do any prints. We're only going to do solid colors. <laughs> she, she started laughing in my face because a pattern maker um, to the uninitiated in fashion manufacturing is, is like the architect of the dress. Yeah, the person um, who cuts out the shapes. Exactly, exactly. The person who designs on a white piece of paper how the different pieces of fabric are supposed to be laid out and cut. And I thought pattern, she meant like floral patterns or checkered patterns. Or plaid. So we were gonna yeah. Find yeah, exactly. I thought that's what a pattern maker was. And so I was like, don't worry, we're just going to do like navy dresses. And um, so that is that is how much I didn't know. When we come back, how Sarah got a crash course in dressmaking, how she tried and failed to raise money and how she and Miyako discovered what it means to have a bank account with a minus sign. Stay with us. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to How I Built This from NPR. Hey, welcome back to How I Built This. I'm Guy Raz. So it's 2011, and Sarah's teamed up with a well-known designer named Miyako Nakamura. And they begin to imagine what a new line of clothing for professional women could look like. I'm embarrassed to say that I once bought 20 somewhat odd thousand dollars of clothing from a luxury department store, which really only amounted to like seven pieces because each one was so expensive, because I wanted to show Miyako the kind of clothes that I wanted her to design. And by the way, I, I did return it. You returned them, yes. Yes, right? I yes. did. But I was the scariest 24 hours of my life were the, the 24 hours where I had those seven dresses in my possession in my apartment. I was like, what if we have a fire? But I, you know, we, and then I just started showing her. I was like, you know, this style, it's so beautiful. It would actually be perfect for work, but it cost $25,000. And describe the style, like clean lines, dark blacks, grays, like what, what do they look like? It was tailored, and I think most importantly, the fit was good. Um, and when I say the fit was good, so um, I have since learned a lot about pattern making and fitting clothing. Most brands, if you're lucky, the designer will fit the garment on a real fit model once before it goes into production. If the fit on something you buy is off, it's probably because it wasn't fitted correctly or it went into production before all of the errors were corrected. Luxury brands can afford to do three or four fittings to really perfect the fit, whereas lower priced brands, they might be fitting it once or maybe never. They might just go straight to production. And I mean, there are so many things that are involved in good fit, but that was really one thing that I, I wanted her to understand is the way your body feels when you're wearing a well-fitted garment, mm. it's magical. And you just can't get that at most of the price points that are out there. And who did you tell her to imagine she was designing for? Like oh, what? me. <laughs> and what was the job? It was, it was a, a woman working, doing what? You know, we had always three tests. One was called the taxi test. So if you're climbing into a taxi, can you jump in without ripping your scheme? Right. The other one was the bend over test, which is um, if you if you bend over, can the person sitting opposite from you see your cleavage or your bra? Right. Because that's strike two. And then strike three was, can you see underwear lines? Every morning while I was working at Bain or, or private equity, I would always turn around and check the mirror to make sure that my underwear lines weren't actually showing through right. whatever I was wearing. And those were the three tests. And so with every garment that we were making, I said, I just want you to make sure that those three bases are covered. And so 
I would just move around in every single garment that she made to make sure that it met those things. And and I guess th- this is a good place to to kind of talk about confidence in in a, in a work environment, right? I mean, it sounds like you were like you were looking to design something that would make women feel more confident in the workplace. Is that is that more or less right? Yeah, that's. I mean, you put it perfectly. I I just didn't want women to have to worry. Working women have to worry enough. Yeah. <laughs> about whatever it is that they're doing. The last thing I want them to worry about is the clothes that they're wearing. And um, I'm sure men can relate to this too. When you leave home that morning and you're not quite confident in whatever it is you're wearing, Mm -hmm. like maybe your sweater has a hole in it, or maybe your pants are are a little bit dirty, or maybe they're just not quite fitting right. And it's always in the back of your mind a little bit. Hmm. And um, I just wanted to do away with all that. So once you had sort of the the first prototypes or agreed upon designs... How did you get them made? Where did you get them made? In the garment district of of Manhattan. Right. I didn't realize the, the extent to which manufacturing is still very much alive in, in New York. And, you know, just when I was working at Bain, I was working right in Times Square. And I, I couldn't believe that, you know, these factories were literally two blocks, three blocks south of me. And you open the elevators and it is just rows and rows of sewing machines. And I, I just didn't even know this industry existed. But mm. um, that is where we made our first run of dresses. And I, I make it sound easy, but it wasn't at all. Um, most factories are not willing to work with a no name because, uh, I mean, small designers come and go. And so I, I didn't realize, like, I was like, well, I'm willing to pay you money. And they're like, it doesn't matter if you're willing to pay us money. Like, we need sustainable businesses. So if you're not going to be around in a year, which was true of, of most fashion brands, then we don't want to start this partnership. And so, you know, we had to beg um, our first factory to make the dresses for us. And at this stage, they were just samples. We weren't even doing factory runs. But I think Miyako's experience was everything. So they, they trusted us because Miyako was doing it. Um, you know, and I was just the woman who signed the checks. And so you got a factory to agree to make you just a few samples of each item? Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, the other thing that's scary in retail businesses is inventory. And because we only had $70,000, I didn't want to tie up my cash in inventory. And so we decided that we would do trunk shows and we would bring samples and we would bring one of every size and we would have people try them on. And based on that, we would place orders. Right. And a trunk show is literally like bringing a trunk and going to someone's apartment or some small space and hopefully people will show up inviting people to come. That is correct. I think we did, gosh, a dozen or so in the first year. And um, it was hard work. You know, you're lugging around suitcases. I was lugging around fabric, rolls of fabric on my shoulder through the garment district. It's a very physically intensive experience. And who did you invite to the trunk shows? How did you even get people to show up? Friends and, and former colleagues. Coming to where? Um, We rented this hotel suite. We turned the bathroom into a dressing room, the shower stall into a dressing room. I think we we created one more makeshift one. And the first two trunk shows, I think, you know, legitimately, it was really just my friends and friends of friends coming to be supportive. But I think by the third trunk show, I hardly knew anybody there. And what what started happening was um, women would be telling each other at the workplace. Uh, We had zero money to spend on marketing. So, you know, it wasn't like we were inviting editors or taking out ads or any of that. It was women just telling other women. I remember there was a group of women from Goldman at our our third trunk show. And I was like, how did you hear about us? And they were like, oh, well, Jenny saw so-and-so wearing this dress and she asked her where she got it. And here we are. And Hmm. most products that people make, you rely on editors, magazines, ads to spread the word. It's it's essential for your business. And I think one thing I didn't quite realize, you know, women, they're not looking to fashion magazines to tell them what to wear to work. They're turning to each other. They're asking each other, where'd you get that? Where'd you, where'd you shop for that? And so that was that was hugely beneficial in the early days. And so you and Miyako would, would just be at these trunk shows describing the clothing? Or was it just you? Yeah, no. So it was me, my other co-founder, Nuri, um, who is someone I worked with at Bain. You you brought her on because you needed somebody with a different skill set that, that... No, it, it was actually the opposite of Miyako. I needed someone who, who could do what I was doing because at that point I was getting stretched too thin. I should also share probably at that point I was, you know, I wasn't taking a salary. I was tutoring to make ends meet. So usually every day from... 
you know, I would wake up and then I would work. Uh, I would be running around the factory, the pattern maker, the factory, the pattern maker. And then from 4 to 7 p.m., my apartment would turn into a tutoring facility and I would be teaching the SATs or fifth grade math or seventh grade English. Wow. And then I would start working on my business again in the evening. I mean, I just had no time to attend to everything that I needed to. And Nari was someone who I, I worked with. She was actually the first person I managed at Bain. And so, you know, I said, I want to take this company to the next level. Do you want to come? And hmm. she said, sure. And she she also didn't have a salary. I couldn't pay her a salary, so she started tutoring too. Um, hmm. And that's how the two of us made ends meet. All right, so in 2012, you're doing trunk shows, and you're getting some people to show up. But, I mean, you can't sustain a business doing trunk shows, right? And And I have to imagine that... You guys were not making any money in that first year. (laughs) Um, You know, I think it was after we did our our first set of trunk shows. And and by the way, we sold out. I mean, that was, we had made about $50,000 at that point. And we said, okay, this is a quote unquote proof of concept. We're going to go raise money now. So already in 2012, that's where you, you said, all right, now is time to go out and raise money. Yeah, that's right. I was like, you know what? Not only do we have product, we have made money now. So this raising money thing, it's going to be a piece of cake. I mean, you Um, hadn't really made money because your money was bright. You had expenses and you had to pay for the fabric. Yeah, we had generated revenue. You know, I think it was um, uh, in the fundraising world, they talk about pre-revenue companies and post-revenue companies. And so I was like, well, we are a post-revenue company. And um, okay, we said, you know... I don't know. Do we want to raise a million dollars, two million dollars? Um, and, and so, who did you who did you reach out to? We started with friends and family. Um, this is a, a trick that I pass on to other entrepreneurs who are trying to raise money in the very early stages, because a lot of people, I think women especially, tell me they feel bad about asking for money. They feel mm. nervous. What if I lose their money, et cetera, et cetera? And what I tell them is rich people get asked for money all the time. Yeah. It's you and 500 other people asking for their money. And one phrase that I developed, which I, I started using in all of my emails, is if you or anyone you know might be interested, please let me know. I think the you or anyone else you know gave the other person an elegant out if they weren't interested. You know, they could say, like, yes, I'll think about who I know. Or if they're interested, they'll say, like, actually, I'm interested. Right. Or they really might connect you with, with someone else. Were you able to raise any money that in that in 2012? I raised, so contrary to, you know, what we thought we wanted to do, which was like, I don't know, a million, a two million, we raised $400,000 and it took me nine months. So then what? You continue to do these trunk shows? Because that's not going to, right, that's not going to cut it. You, you're talking about other companies like Bonobos and Warby Parker and these are e-commerce companies, right? They, they've got websites where people can can order stuff. So Yeah, that's right. And around this time, this direct-to-consumer was becoming a thing. And so online was where it was at. And I think I, I foolishly had this notion that if you launch a website, your customers come and they shop and you become millionaires. Yeah. Um, of course, I think we have all learned uh, since then that that is not the case. But at the time, there was such a media frenzy around these new DTC businesses. And I, I just thought like, wow, it's so easy. Like, Let's launch a site. And so we did, can never forget this, uh, 3 a.m. of January 1st, 2013. That was the official launch of our e-commerce site, mmlefleur.com. And and the name MM, I mean, obviously Lafleur is your last name. Where, where did that come from? Oh, it's my mom's nickname. Her nickname is Mimi, which uh, is a ch- child's way of saying eyes in Japanese. And she, mm. she has really big eyes. And so that was her nickname. And initially, actually, it was called Meme Lafleur. But Meme in French means Nana. So after a while, I, re- I realized, like, Nana Flower doesn't actually have the best ring to it. Like, maybe we should change that. And so we took the initials of Meme, which is MM, and uh, made it MM Lafleur. All right. So 2013, you launched the e-commerce site. And it was yeah. the same kind of model. People would order something, and then you would have it made in the factory? No. At that point, we did decide to hold inventory. How many did you have made? Let's see. We probably did a run of 50 for each because I think that was the minimum. So we probably have 350 dresses. So 350 dresses. All sitting in my apartment. All yeah. sitting in your apartment. You put up the website, sit back. You're like waiting for the orders to come in and? And um, crickets. 
<laughs> crickets is the short of it. Um, like no one is g- clicking on the website and... Like, I don't know, maybe we get like 10, 15 orders on the day of launch. And then afterwards we get like three, two. I'm sure there were days with zero. I mean, And those three or two, it might be $200 or $400. It's Correct. And you thought just putting up a website, people would find you. Uh, yes. <laughs> that was my very naive assumption. And you presumably you didn't have money to to do a lot of marketing. No, I mean, yes, we it was really still continuing to do trunk shows. We had revenue goals for the month and so if we weren't meeting our revenue goals then we would you know, set up a trunk show stat um, and uh, try to make some money off of that. And the trunk shows actually were always quite lucrative. You know, we knew that when our customers actually tried on the clothes in person, they they, they loved them. So often women were, were buying multiple dresses. Right. But online, I, it was just a totally different story. We could not sell our dresses. So I, I read that in that first year, 2013, you did $300,000 in sales, which on one level sounds really impressive, but on another level for an apparel business where the costs and expenses are high, I mean, that's not that's not a whole... Was that... Did, did you meet your goal, your, your targets? No, we did not. I think actually the, for the first year, my goal was like a million. So we felt quite short of that. And in 2013, we had hired three other people. And presumably you couldn't pay them a whole lot. No. You know, we were paying ourselves very, very little. And we've only raised $400,000 at that point. So, you know, we're, we're watching the, the cash dwindle. All right. So that first year, you're doing a third of what you were hoping to do. You get into 2014, and I have to assume your cash reserves were getting close to running out. Not only did we run out, it actually went into the negatives. Our bank account, I think at one point, said like negative 2,000 or something, and I didn't know you could draw down beyond zero. So that was a wake-up call, and uh, I had to go out and fundraise again. Um, Same people? Same seed folks? No, no, no. I I knew I couldn't go back to them because we haven't done what we said we wanted to do on the on the cash that we had raised at that point. So I had to go out and fundraise again. And the most amazing part of this story is um, meeting Bob. And and who's Bob? Bob Deutsch. Bob was a CFO at these two insurance companies. I had gone to meet my husband's friend's father, who was a very successful entrepreneur for some advice. Secretly, I'm also hoping maybe he'll invest. But he said, you know, you got to meet with my former CFO, Bob. Bob and I have started two companies together. They sold both. Incredibly successful. And I go and meet Bob and I say, hey, Bob, I'm just having a really hard time trying to raise money. Can you please give me some guidance? And he said, well, you know, the first thing we should think about is how much should your company be valued at and how much do you want to give up? And I was like, I'm willing to have my company valued at anything just to yeah, keep right. the just business keep it going. Afloat. Yeah, exactly. And he's like, "No, no. Like step one, let's go do this." And so he essentially gives me a homework assignment. A homework assignment to help you figure out what what you think the company's worth. Yep, and and how much I should be raising. And um, I go back to Bob, and he says, "This is really interesting. Like these are the facts that you need to go out with when you go and talk to these VCs." None of the VC conversations actually go anywhere. But armed with this information, I'm able to say, my company, we've already generated revenue. Similar companies, when they were at my size, were raising this amount of money at this valuation. Can we talk? So what did you value the company at at the time? Oh, gosh. It was um, $6 million maybe. When you, um, you are out of money and you've got to raise money and Bob is helping you kind of develop – a pitch, mm-hmm. and you went to, to VCs, and what was their response when you pitched them on this company? Their response was the same response that I would basically hear for the next three to four years, which is, congratulations, it looks like you started a real great niche business for yourself. But we're not interested. Was oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Niche business is essentially, it's code word for this is small potatoes. And, yeah. you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, what about working women is such a niche business? You know, there are 30 million women age 25 to 45 who work in some sort of corporate environment. And these women spend on average for women making 75K and up $4,000 a year on clothes to wear to work. And so that's roughly a 100 to $120 billion market, you know, 
to me, nothing about that was niche. But were you, I mean, were you mostly pitching to men? Yes, yes. And not to, I don't want to, you know, pile on it, but but I have to assume they didn't quite, you know, they, they were not going to be able to relate to this. This is, maybe they didn't fully understand the opportunity. Yeah, there was a lot of that. I'm sure you've heard this from your other founders, but there was a lot of, oh, I'm going to have my wife who is a stay-at-home mom try it. You know, nothing against her, but she's been at home for 30 years and probably has different needs for what she wants to wear every single day. Or, you know, I'll have my my 17-year-old daughter try, try it. Um, it just, just kind of lumping in all women into the same category. Mm. You know, the most honest thing I heard was um, I had an investor call me after we did the pitch, and he said to me, we really like you. We really think there's a lot to like about the business, but it's just so early, and we're four guys sitting around the room, and we just can't get a gut feel on the product. Hmm. I've repeated that elsewhere, and people are like, oh, my God, I can't believe he said that. How sexist. But to me, it was it was a relief. Hmm. That was like the first time where someone said to me, like, it's actually not you. It's, it's, it's us not being able to understand the product. But then I think the the part that I uh, didn't share was that Bob, after seeing me go through a couple of these VC meetings, um, you know, I think he's seeing how determined I am to to raise this money. He says, you know what, Um, I'm willing to write a check, which I I honestly at that point wasn't expecting because he's more coaching me through this process. And he was like, you know, I'm I'm willing to invest 50, maybe $100,000, which is a lot of money for us at that time. And he says to me, and are you interested in raising raising maybe a little bit more money from me and my friends. And I said, you know, absolutely. And he says, okay, give me give me 24 hours. And so 24 hours later, Bob calls me and he says, okay, Sarah, um, I put together $400,000 for you. Wow. That is the quickest any single investor has put together a round like that for me. And I think Bob has these very close connections with other business people, well-established business people, and and they do deals together all the time. I think they, they pass each other deals and they move together, they talk to each other, they invest together. And I just never saw that with any of my other female angel investors. Here's a question now, right? Yeah. Because I think a lot of people who start businesses this is a challenge, right? You've got to balance, you know, your independence and your vision and what you, you know, the ownership you want to retain, but you needed money. Yes. So I have to assume at this point, you were willing to pretty much give up what you needed to give up to keep the business afloat. Yes, it's so true. And I I think you're actually, you're pointing to something really important there. And I catch myself doing this too now. And I, I really try to stop myself from doing it, which is telling other entrepreneurs like, don't just take anyone's money or be really careful who you take money from. Um, that's all well and good when you've got cash in the bank. Yeah. Uh, when you don't, um, it's really unhelpful advice because it's true. You really want to make sure who you take money from, but you also just want to keep your company alive. So you had you were in that position in 2014, which means that, you know, you had to be willing to give up, you know, quite a bit of your of this company that you started. Yeah, that's right. You know, I think that's where, I mean, meeting Bob, and he ended up being a phenomenal partner. But Bob could have also been someone terrible. He could have really screwed me over. Yeah, because everyone's seen Shark Tank where they're like, I'll give you $25,000 <laughs> for 70% of the company. I, You know, I was just like, I, I can't watch that show anymore because every time I'm like, walk away, walk away. But, um, yeah, $75,000 when you've got negative $2,000 in the bank is pretty precious. It's a lot. Yeah. It's, all right. So you get this money. 2014, you're saved from extinction. Mm-hmm. But meantime, you've got a website and no one's going to it. And you've got inventory piling up, which is not a good place to be in because at some point, designs are going to change or tastes are going to change and that you're going to end up shredding all that stuff. Yes. Uh, you know, we had moved into a really humble <laughs> office in the garment district on 35th street it was above a methadone clinic and i would just walk into this tiny room and i would see it flowing to the ceiling in in inventory and i would think to myself oh my god we are going to die under a mountain of dresses and i think that was the point where i was like i i saw the dresses and i said what if we just sent our existing customers an email asking them if we could send them a box of dresses because we somehow have to physically move these dresses out of here and so um, 
we we sent our I think we had like a thousand customers on our, our mailing list at that time and we said we'll send you a box of products that we think you'll like and if you like them you can keep them if you don't uh, you can return them and so that was the pitch so this was more like a now like a, we're going to send you a box of stuff and what you want you keep and you pay for and what you don't want you return to us yeah and 18 percent of customers responded to that email saying sure send me something I don't have time. It would be so great if you chose it for me. (laughs) And uh, we ended up sending those 180 boxes out and making more money in that one week than we ever had in any month leading up to it. I mean, that model was starting to be out there, right? There was literally a company called Trunk Club and and Stitch Fix and some of these companies that we know. And and you you guys were not doing that? You Um, weren't picking outfits for people, sending them and letting them pick and then send stuff back? No, we were not. Um, you know, I think we we just thought it, it was actually it was interesting because even when I suggested this initially to my team, um, there were a lot of when I say a lot of people, there were four people uh, who said like, "Oh no, I, I would never want someone else to pick out mm. what it is that I should wear. Like, I, I want to choose for myself. Why would I want someone else to pick for me?" And you know, I kind of had to say, um, Annie, Annie was my CMO. Um, Annie and I were in the camp of, you know, we're not fashion lovers. Like, if someone else who, who understands fashion better than we do told us what we should be wearing, like, that's actually a pretty amazing service. Mm-hmm. So we, we launched this, I guess you could call it a beta uh, in February. And operationally, it was a total nightmare. I mean, we sent the wrong size to people. Some people were like, why, why did you send this to me? I don't understand. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of those things. But the numbers really spoke for themselves. We There was more demand for that that service than, mm. than we had ever seen. Uh, I'm trying to f- figure out, I mean, how did you even know what to send to people? For a good number of those 1,000 customers, we had met them through trunk shows, and so they had already purchased something with us. Right, so you had some data about them. We had some data about what they had picked, and we knew their size. And then, um, actually, that was a really brilliant moment by Annie, who said, you know, I wonder if we should try this with new customers. And so she said, um, you know, why don't we email a group of people who've never shopped with us before and ask them to fill out some basic information about themselves? And based on that, why don't we tell them we're going to send a box of dresses to you? And you call them bento boxes, right? Yeah, we did. We didn't call them bentos back then. But when we launched it in its official form later that year in the fall, um, we called them bentos. And that really actually started to move the needle, right? Like it, you, you actually started to see real revenue coming in that seemed to point in the right direction. Yeah, that was the moment that Silicon Valley calls finding your product market fit. We launched it into official form October 2014. We suddenly went from not being able to pay rent to tripling our revenue, you know, oftentimes month over month. And by the end of that year, 2014, um, did you, do you remember what your your revenue was? Yeah, it was um, 8 million, but we had made more than half of that in the last 12 weeks of the year. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I mean, obviously, that model, right, um, like the, the choosing and, and sending people clothing was working, um, but it, it still doesn't explain to me why it would just, like, explode in the last 12 weeks of the year. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you walk into a clothing store, price is maybe one of 10 things that you're considering when you right. decide you want to buy that thing. You know, do you like the feel? Do you like how it fits on you? Do you like how the salesperson is selling it to you? Whereas when you're shopping online, first of all, it's really hard to tell what what products actually look like. And when you see this like really simple black dress, it's not going to jump out at you. And you're thinking like, am I really going to spend $195 on a pair of black pants? And I think what Bento did in many ways is it took that decision paralysis away mm. because we were getting our products into our customers' hands and only once they, they tried it on were they really understanding why these pants cost $195, you know, and then, and then they start to say, oh, okay, I get it. I get I get why this costs $250. I get why it's worth it. Um, but it is really hard to make that case online in e-commerce. And it, it, I, I think things have changed a lot since then. People are buying $2,000 Peloton bikes online. So I think that that sentiment has shifted a lot, but yeah. back in 2014, it was a really tough sell. So I, I want to touch on a slightly sensitive topic, which is cost, right? Yeah. Some people might look at your clothing and say, you know, you know, 
I get it. It's not designer. It's not Chanel. But still, you know, sure. $240 for a, a, a dress or, you know, $225 for a pair of trousers. What am I getting out of this that I can't get from Zara or H&M? Yeah, we hear that all the time. And um, we were actually briefly, briefly talking to a department store, a luxury department store. And, you know, they said to us, you could sell these dresses for $700. That's what we would sell it for. Um, and we said, exactly. But the point is we sell it for 200 250 That's the That's the point. But it's little details that I think most fashion designers wouldn't care about. And I think that's really that's really where we set ourselves apart and and try to justify the price point. You know, does it have pockets? Can you zip it up yourself easily? We're always checking to make sure that you can zip up yourself because you might be traveling by yourself and be mm-hmm. in a hotel room by yourself. Um, you know, does it does it feel comfortable on the skin uh, because you're going to be spending 14 hours in it? It's my incredibly practical nature wanting machine washability and wrinkle resistance and comfort and everything that I wear. And then Miyako really saying... I've spent 20 years training to deliver the best designs in the world. So let me figure out how I can do that for for working women. And I think the place where those two things meet, that's M.M. Lafleur. Hmm. All right. So as you really started to to see traction, um, presumably your your biggest market was in New York. And then and then where where were you also like what other markets were you seeing traction in, you know, by, by yeah, 2014, so- 2015? New York was always number one, still is number one. But we saw ourselves growing in two other markets, which was D.C. Right. um, And then the other one being San Francisco. And D.C. was fascinating. You know, we have a lot of congresswomen, a couple of senators who wear our clothes, and staffers, too. Um, You know, I was uh, on Capitol Hill a few months ago and walked into the congressional building and immediately saw a number of our customers. Wow. And then on the other end, we were seeing customers in San Francisco, which became our our third largest market. And these women were saying to us, you know, I don't actually want to go to work in jeans and a hoodie. I make money. I want to wear nice clothes. And at the same time, if I dress too nicely, people think I'm interviewing. Yeah. And in some ways, the dress code is even more nebulous. Can you help me figure out what to wear? And so Miyako actually started working on what we're calling Power Casual, a Power Casual line for them, where it's it's much more relaxed. It's a lot of pant-based, knit-based offerings. But... It's a a more dressed up version of the the jeans and the hoodie, and um, so we have a really loyal fan base out in San Francisco as well. So once you started to get like members of Congress wearing your clothing, and women in D.C. and San Francisco, and did it at that point become easier to raise more money? <laughs> I don't think it had anything to do with who was wearing it. You know, what we started to see was was traction and revenue. Four years into it, so around 2017, a VC investor approached us and he said, hey, we're just interested in learning more about you. Could mm. you tell us? And I, I think at that point I had a big a big chip on my shoulder because we had had total failure trying to raise from, from VCs. You're four and, years in and you had not raised four, any money from VCs at that point. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Um, and so I was like, you know, we're going we're gonna to do this without VCs. Like that's just the way it's going to be. But then we, we met this with, with this investor who was – just really wonderful. And his wife was a customer. He said to me, you know, I know nothing about women's clothing, but um, I'm a good student and I'm willing to learn. So will you teach me? Hmm. And just came at it so differently, um, which really got me thinking about VCs in a a different way uh, up until that point. And so they did invest at that point? Yeah, they did. And because up until that point, the first four years, all your money came from friends, family, and then like family investment firms or you know not yeah. right and 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 you know I'm sure that was frustrating that VCs were not you know throwing money away I have to th- imagine that that was a huge advantage because VC money can be a real double-edged sword as we've learned from previous guests on the show yes um, you know I got to hold on to a lot more of my company because we couldn't raise <laughs> for a while but the result was, um, you know, we were, I think, in a position we could, we, where we could better absorb those financial resources. So there wasn't risk of other investors coming on and saying, like, wait a minute, wait a minute, like, you got to change your, your product because yeah. this isn't working. I, I'm assuming that your financials are not public because you're not a public company, but I, the, the last 
number I saw was for 2017 where you, you did 70 million in revenue. I have to assume it's higher now. Um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, <laughs> do, do you, at this point now, do you know how much money you've raised in total? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, we don't disclose it, and it's so funny because um, I, I think there's a real there's a real dark side to talking about how much money you've raised, and I think what happens often in startup culture is that that is what you become known for. Oh, you're that's the, your legitimacy. Your exactly. badge of legitimacy is how much you've, and that's your status, right? Exactly. Exactly. And it sounds like you you were you believed in that for a while. Like when these VCs weren't giving you money. Maybe you thought that they that money would give you this veneer of legitimacy. Oh, for sure. It's uh, <laughs> if you can't tell already, there's this is like a, a constant process of self doubt and me thinking that I'm a loser and and trying to you know navigate throughout this process and and not being able to raise from VCs repeatedly uh, when other. DTC companies are raising money, it, it just um, makes you question a lot. But I think the result is like what I did was I ended up just spending a lot of time with my customers. Yeah. Internally, we call our customer Samantha, but you know, where is Samantha working? How do we make her happy? How do we make make products that she really loves? And so by the time we took in that money, that precedent was already set. Like investors, you know, while I am so grateful for them and, and very thankful for them, they don't direct the future of the company. When you think about um, how hard it was to convince people that this was going to be more than a niche business, right? And yeah. um, you know, and and you're a, a business school reject, and I, <laughs> I say that <laughs> with utmost respect. I, I wear um, it proudly. Yes, you should wear it proudly. Yeah. Um, do, do you? I don't know. Does part of you kind of feel like, see, I told you so? I, I feel that way. The I told you so uh, when it comes to working women not being a niche category. I feel very strongly about that. But in terms of, of you know, feeling like I'm the business school reject no longer, um, no, not not really. I think, um, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm always being tested. I've never really had this moment where I've, I've thought, like, I've showed you. I, I feel like I am... The startup world has a, a way of always putting you back in your place. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, sure. I think that's, that's the way I would describe it. I mean... You know, this is a company that's doing now, let's say, c close to maybe more, maybe less than $100 million. Do you now, are you able to kind of just take a, a breath and say, all right, we, we've made it, like nothing to worry about anymore? Or do you still have anxiety about, you know, are there things that still keep you up at night? Oh, of course. I mean, the, the whiskey on the rocks in the middle of the night, that never ends. <laughs> I feel like I'm running a different company every two years. And this stage of the business brings a whole different set of challenges that um, that the first two years did. Um, you know, I will I will qualify that by saying the first two years were by far by far the hardest two years of I think my life. It was it was just incredibly lonely, incredibly hard getting this business off the ground. When you think about your your journey, how much do you think about um, that? You know, that this all coming as a result of your hard work and skill and and, and versus luck. Oh, uh, it's 99% luck. <laughs> I always go back to that experience I had in Zambia. It is mostly luck. Being born to the right parents at the right time. Even just like watching how different my mom's journey was as a female entrepreneur in Japan versus me born, you know, 37 years later and the benefits and the, the funding I am able to get in a way that I know that she was never able to. That is all luck. And yes, a lot of hard work too. That's Sarah LaFleur. She's the co-founder and CEO of M.M. LaFleur. And by the way, a word of caution, try not to confuse her with the other Sarah LaFleur. One of the weird things that happened when I was doing research, the first thing that came up was a Canadian actress named Sarah LaFleur. Oh, I know. I, I feel like I have to just reach out to her because yeah, you have to. I have gotten scripts sent to me. I'm sure. Um, Can you do voice work for, for us? <laughs> I read her bio. I know yeah. all about her now, too. I could interview her on How I Built This. You should. You're like, the work is done. 